This video will help you identify if you are considered a non-eligible designated beneficiary, and if you are, how to treat required minimum distributions. If you don't know who I am, my name is Chris Dime. I'm a certified financial planner out of Edmonds, Washington, and I specialize in working with folks to and through retirement. It's not uncommon that as clients are getting a little bit older, the likelihood of them coming into funds from loved ones themselves is gonna go up. And generally, these funds are gonna pass to them by way of retirement accounts. So these would be things like inherited 401ks, inherited IRAs, et cetera. And this will pretty much apply to any of your beneficiaries if you have individuals listed as beneficiaries in your retirement accounts. Unless for whatever reason you're planning on bouncing your final you know, income check in retirement to the undertaker, odds are you're probably gonna have some residual balance left over in your retirement accounts, which means this video is gonna be applicable to your next generation. After the passing of the SECURE Act in 2019, the IRS defined three different types of beneficiaries who are possibly able to inherit retirement accounts. These three beneficiary types are eligible designated beneficiaries, non-eligible designated beneficiaries, and then not designated beneficiaries. Now, each of these categories have their own definitions, they have their own uh, options for how to treat these retirement accounts, as well as rules requiring minimum distributions from these accounts as well. In my last video, we broke down what it means to be an eligible designated beneficiaries, and if you are defined as an eligible designated beneficiary, how to treat required minimum distributions. However, not everybody falls into the camp of being an eligible designated beneficiary, and for those individuals who are listed as a beneficiary on a retirement account, and they're not considered an eligible designated beneficiary, they are considered a non-eligible designated beneficiary. So in this video, we'll cover what it means to be a non-eligible designated beneficiary, and if you are an NEDB and you inherit funds, how to treat required minimum distributions out of these accounts. So let's jump in. As a quick refresher on required minimum distributions or RMDs, those are the mandatory minimum distributions an individual must take out of a particular retirement account. Normally, this is a problem for folks in their 70s, whereby at that point, the IRS starts to levy required minimum distributions on their own personal retirement accounts if those retirement accounts are pre-tax. Roth accounts do not have required minimum distributions for when it's your own Roth IRA or Roth 401k. Now, if you inherit a Roth account, we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But for the most part, when somebody's in their 70s, they are gonna start getting hit with required minimum distributions and they'll need to take out a certain amount of money. Required minimum distributions also apply to the next generation who might inherit your retirement account because every type of beneficiary has their own rules on how to take out their own required minimum distributions once they come into this money. So next up to define what a non-eligible designated beneficiary is. To keep it simple, if you're an individual who's not an eligible designated beneficiary, then you're a non-eligible designated beneficiary. And as a reminder on who is or is not an eligible designated beneficiary, there are five categories of eligible designated beneficiaries. Those are spouses, those who are not more than 10 years younger than the decedent, that would be minors of the decedent, that would be individuals who are chronically ill and individuals who are disabled. For more guidance on that, look at my last video on breaking down those definitions. So let's fast forward and say you've identified that you're not one of those five aforementioned categories, then you're called an NEDB and you've got some rules to follow relative to required minimum distributions. Your options for how to treat these retirement accounts that you're inheriting are gonna be based on whether the decedent passed away before or during slash after their required beginning date. And the required beginning date is the year in which they were supposed to start taking required minimum distributions themselves. Now, whether someone passed away before or after their required beginning date, that's gonna come down to their date of birth as well as their date of death. So if you have those two numbers, you can verify whether somebody passed away before or after their RBD online through some calculators, which I'll link down below. However, oftentimes it's attractive to take a simple route and look at a previous investment statement from the decedent. Unfortunately, that isn't always the best route to go because there's a chance that the decedent was in their required beginning date years and they did not take out a required minimum distribution and maybe they were supposed to. So it's best to verify through some online calculators based on their date of birth and their date of death. So let's fast forward again and say you've identified whether the individual passed away before, on, or after their required beginning date. Once you've figured that out, your options for how to treat these funds are incredibly limited. If the decedent passed away before their required beginning date, you'll need to follow the 10-year rule and if the individual passed away on or after their required beginning date, you'll need to follow the 10-year rule. 
That pretty much sums it up. Have a good day. Well, I suppose we have a little bit more time, so I'll jump into what that 10-year rule means. The 10-year rule was a brand new distribution schedule that was enacted within the SECURE Act 1.0 that came out in 2019. And there's been a little bit of confusion on it in the tax space, and so this video will clear things up. The 10-year rule states that by the 10th year following the year of death, the retirement account must be fully liquidated. Now the confusion came with some misinterpretations as to whether or not required minimum distributions were owed in years one through nine following the date of death, or if every non-eligible designated beneficiary could just wait until that 10th year and then fully liquidate the account. The IRS has since clarified some things with notice 2022-53, whereby they, they explicate that if the decedent passed away before their required beginning date, then there are no required minimum distributions owed in years one through nine following the date of death, but you still have to liquidate the account entirely in that 10th year. They also clarified that if the individual passed away on or after their required beginning date, then there are required minimum distributions owed in years one through nine based on the beneficiary's life expectancy, and that entire account must be liquidated in year 10. So it's kind of a combination of a stretch IRA as well as a 10-year rule full liquidation in the 10th year. I guess on the topic of stretch IRA, I should clarify, that's why being an eligible designated beneficiary is so attractive because they have the most optionality. Non-eligible designated beneficiaries are subject entirely to the 10-year rule and there is no stretch IRA provision. This was like one of the biggest things that the SECURE Act 1.0 got rid of was the stretch IRA used to apply to pretty much anybody inheriting these retirement accounts. After the clarification of EDBs and non-EDBs, then that's where the stretch IRA was eliminated for non-EDBs, which is a good number of people who do inherit retirement accounts. Now, whether or not you do need to take out required minimum distributions in years one through nine, it might be in your best interest to accelerate that distribution schedule. Keep in mind, if you are someone that must take out required minimum distributions in years one through nine, that's simply the minimum bar to meet to distribute funds from this account. Theoretically, you can take out as much as you want in that first year, second year, third year, whatever. Now, there might be some reasons why you would look to accelerate the distribution schedule on an inherited retirement account, even if you don't have to in years one through nine. Perhaps maybe you forecast in the 10th year following the date of death, you forecast that you're gonna be in a very confiscatory tax space, which is just a very fancy way of saying you think your taxes are gonna be really high. For example, maybe you anticipate a sharp rise in base salary through some promotions in, that are gonna happen over the next 10 years. Maybe you forecast in year 10 that the company you're working with is gonna go public and maybe they give you a bunch of restricted stock units. That counts as compensation in that current year. Maybe in that 10th year you forecast your spouse going back to work. If they took a knee from the workforce for a couple of years, but in this 10th year coming up, you anticipate a higher income as a family. These are all things that could factor into a decision to maybe accelerate distributions from this retirement account. Keep in mind though, once you distribute funds from this inherited retirement account, it is no longer getting that tax deferral that's included inside of an IRA. So even though the decedent passed away and you inherit these funds, that money is still within the shroud of tax deferral. So it's something you'll wanna factor into the equation as to whether or not you should accelerate distributions from this account. Because once you take money out of a tax deferred environment, it's really hard to find another tax deferred space for it to go. And odds are, if you don't need the money, you're just gonna reinvest it into a non-retirement investment account. And those non-retirement investment accounts don't have any tax deferral benefits. The other thing to keep in mind though too, is if you accelerate distributions and then the market tanks potentially in year nine, then you might've missed out on a great opportunity to take out funds at a very low dollar value, which equates to a very low amount of income taxes. And then as long as you reinvest the money and wait for the markets to rebound, it's as if you never really lost any money in the first place. Now, that's a bit of market timing, which philosophically I am vehemently against. However, it is something to be mindful of that there's still market fluctuations that occur within this retirement account. And over a 10 year time horizon, there's bound to be some volatility. I guess unless you invest the entire retirement account in the cash, but at that point, I don't know why you would keep it inside of an IRA. Another type of retirement account that's pretty common to inherit nowadays are gonna be Roth retirement accounts, Roth 401ks, Roth IRAs, et cetera. And the treatment of these accounts is a bit unique. You still have to follow the 10 year rule, whether the decedent passed away before or after their required beginning date. However, since Roth accounts do not have required minimum distributions to the original owner, whenever you inherit Roth IRA funds, regardless of the age of the individual when they passed away, you're allowed to treat this IRA, this Roth IRA, 
as if it was inherited before the individual met their required beginning date. So for non-eligible designated beneficiaries, that means you still have to follow the 10-year rule, but the 10-year rule for pre-required beginning date inheritances means that there is no required minimum distribution in years one through nine, but a full liquidation is still required in year 10. So going back to our previous example as to whether or not you should time pulling money out faster than you have to out of a inherited retirement account based on your tax situation, since Roth IRAs are entirely tax free, there's not really many scenarios where it would make a ton of sense to accelerate distributing money out of the Roth IRA before that 10th year. There might be a couple of situations where perhaps you need liquidity for some real estate purchases or whatever. There's some creative ways of getting around that to still show liquidity in the Roth IRA, but that's a conversation for another time. For the most part, there's not really ever gonna be an advantage to pulling money out faster than you have to out of an inherited Roth IRA because the money compounds tax-free. And then if even if you have to fully liquidate $3 million in year 10, that $3 million is still entirely tax-free to you. Now, if you're watching this video in 2023 and you realize on 2022 or 2021's return, you were a non-eligible designated beneficiary, you inherited funds, but you did not take out a required minimum distribution in years one through nine, which would have been maybe for one or two years you've now forgotten to take out a required minimum distribution when you were supposed to. Don't worry, the IRS understands that their original guidance was a bit fuzzy. So from that previous notice I mentioned, 2022-53, they clarified that if you missed a required minimum distribution in 2021 or 2022, because you didn't know that you needed to take out required minimum distributions, you have been given tax relief, you don't have to make up for lost time, you can just move ahead here in 2023 and follow your distribution schedule. AKA they're waiving any tax penalties or mandatory distributions for that time period. So I would say for the most part, non-eligible designated beneficiaries are fairly cut and dry. You follow the 10-year rule and the 10-year rule required minimum distributions are gonna be based on whether you inherit the funds before or on slash after the decedent's required beginning date. I would say if you're unsure as to how you are classified because of some unique circumstances, it probably would make some sense to seek the guidance of a professional. They've probably got their finger on the pulse as to what the IRS is or is not classifying certain folks as, as well as, of course, these required minimum distribution rules and how to calculate those required minimum distribution rules. So hopefully that was helpful in clarifying if you're not an eligible designated beneficiary, but you are a person, then you're a non-eligible designated beneficiary and you've got some RMDs to potentially be aware of. And at a minimum, you've got an account that you must fully liquidate by the 10th year. If you have further questions, drop them in the chat below, get in touch on the website, we'll get you squared away. Have an awesome rest of the week. We'll chat with you later. Bye.